Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this Greens List breakfast briefing concerning recent developments in contract and the penalties doctrine. I'm Anthony Young, a member of Greens List. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning our two speakers. Um, first of all, it will be Alan Nash and later Dr. Carly Weston Scheiber. But before I do so, may I say that the prospect of listening to barristers speaking about contract law called to mind a not so recent decision of the High Court involving those two things, a barrister and a contract. Some of you may recall the tale of the fair dodging Sydney barrister, Archibald Nugent Robertson. It was the Monday of a long weekend in 1905. At 7.45 p.m., Archibald Nugent Robertson went to Circular Quay in Sydney at the bottom of Erskine Street and entered the wharf of the Balmain New Ferry Company in the company of Miss Mercia Murray, who was a well-known speech and elocution teacher, funny that a barrister should be in her company. The couple wanted to go on one of the company's ferries, but both of the boats had just left. So when Miss Murray indicated that she wanted to catch another boat from another wharf, she and Mr Robertson proceeded to leave. Here their problems began. The difficulty was that entry and exit to the wharf was via turnstiles, above which there was a notice stating that entry and exit was conditional upon the payment of a penny. This was because the company collected fares only at that end of the journey, at Circular Quay. When they attempted to leave, the attendant at the turnstile told them that they needed to leave by another turnstile, and when they went to that exit, the attendant asked for a second penny. They'd paid a penny to en enter and they were being asked for a second penny to leave. Robertson pointed out that he hadn't in fact travelled on the, on the ferry at all and simply wanted to leave the wharf and go about his lawful and proper business. There was uh, a confrontation and during the exchange between Robertson and the attendants, which lasted about five minutes, uh, a crowd of about 200 people gathered they were perhaps not surprisingly hostile to Robertson, asking him why didn't he pay the fare. He was advised to call a constable, but nobody did. And at this point, Robertson paid for Miss Murray to leave, but refused to pay his own penny. He told her that he'd have to say, stay and see it out. She went off and fetched a constable who told Robertson that his course of action should be to pay under protest and to complain to the company, but the advice was refused. Robertson pointed out proudly that he was a lawyer and this was not what he needed to do. Um, uh, finally, he said he wouldn't be detained any longer and so he sought to push through the gap between the turnstile and the bulkhead despite the efforts of the attendants to prevent him. The couple went off to see Miss Murray's parents after which Mr Robertson undeterred returned to the Balmain Ferry Company's boat because that's how he got home. And the same attendant saw him, and one told Robertson that he hadn't paid the fare previously and was in a spot of bother. Still undeterred, as a result of these experiences, Robertson brought an action against the company for assault and false imprisonment. In the finest traditions of New South Wales litigators, Robertson was doggedly determined, to say the least. At his trial, which was heard before the Chief Justice of New South Wales and, and a jury, he succeeded. He obtained judgment for £100 for damages for false imprisonment. The ferry company appealed. Um, its appeal was dismissed at the Intermediate Appellate Court. It then obtained leave to appeal to the High Court where it succeeded. The High Court held that there was no false imprisonment and that Robertson was obliged and ought to have paid the extra penny. The report of the case is in volume four of the Commonwealth Law Report, starting at page 379. Still undeterred, Robertson sought and obtained special leave to appeal to the Privy Council. And the judgment of their lordships was delivered by the Lord Chancellor, Lord Lauburn. In the result, Robertson's appeal was dismissed with costs. Oddly, in the report of the case, Robertson's name was changed to Robinson. At least the High Court of Australia got that part right. The report of the Privy Council decision is in the appeal cases for 1910, starting at page 295. Now, pro plainly, Robertson should have paid the extra penny and escaped all the troubles. Perhaps, though, Robertson should have argued that being prevailed upon for a second penny to escape the wharf from which he'd not travelled anywhere amounted to a penalty. <laughs> 
after listening to Alan and Carly this morning, perhaps we shall know. The first speaker this morning is Alan Nash. He's been practising for about 15 years. He's a commercial barrister with a broad general experience. He's a member of the Intellectual Property Society of Australia and New Zealand and a regular contributor to the IP Forum. He's been an associate to the Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Australia. Uh, his experience both before and since being at the bar extends to matters involving contract, copyright, trademarks, patents, breach of confidence, trade practices, internet, domain name disputes, property and the corporation's law. Uh, please welcome Alan Nash. Thank you for that. Just move this out of the way a bit. Uh, the title of my presentation uh, reflects the fact that in the last year there's been a number of uh, High Court and Superior State Court of Appeal um, decisions that have had a significant impact on uh, contract law and how we understand uh, aspects of contract law. Um, I'm probably going to be a bit more current than a 1910 case in the Privy Council, so don't be too alarmed by uh, uh, the preamble. What, what I'm going to do is focus on issues of construction, especially uh, as they pertain to matters going to performance, um, understanding what it is and a contract that a party is, is to do and what their rights and entitlements are. But this will dovetail with Kylie's presentation, which, which focuses on penalties. I think, oops, focuses on penalties, which is really the other side of the equation in a way, uh, because that arises on questions of non-performance, uh, or at least the non-realisation of events that parties to a contract had anticipated would occur. I propose to cover three things today. First, a sort of a construction generally uh, with a focus on commercial contracts in particular. Uh, a phrase that's probably familiar to most of us, reasonable endeavours and what's meant by that. Uh, and finally, a little section if there's time on implied terms, uh, particularly of good faith and, and other implied terms that govern the uh, overall behavioural performance standards of parties to a contract. On this slide, I've set out a few matters uh, that are the reason why commercial contracts in particular are particularly challenging when it comes to drafting and negotiating them, and also at the other end when it comes to advising on whether there's been a breach of a contract and exactly what uh, parties' obligations and rights under them are, which is an inquiry that's sometimes not made until many years down the track, of course. Uh, so, of course, it's impossible in particularly large transactions to anticipate every uh, vicissitude that's going to happen. There's a need to express complex concepts in words and, and the courts recognise uh, with a contract that the strict grammatical or, or lexical meaning of a clause or a phrase uh, is very rarely going to be determinative of its actual uh, impact. It's the starting point for sure but it's not always the end point. Uh, there's often a parallel need uh, to be efficient and brief. No one except lawyers really wants to have to read a 500 page uh, contract, uh, unless it's warranted in the particular case. Uh, and if often there's often large amounts of money at stake. Now these, these factors, uh, one way or another, are also the reason why uh, contract disputes tend to make their way up through the courts and to the courts of appeal. Uh, it's actually quite a challenging exercise to sometimes understand what is meant by a clause in a commercial agreement. Just a, in this slide, just a bit of a refresher, really, uh, about the general approach to construction of a contract. And I should say, th this is the general approach taken by a court, especially when it comes to the dispute phase uh, of an agreement. But it, it's going to be relevant to bear in mind at the stage when you're drafting and negotiating an agreement as well. So overall, when it comes to interpreting a contract, uh, in Australia, we take what's called the objective approach to contract interpretation. That is, we ask what a reasonable person in the position of the parties would have understood the terms to mean. That's assessed, assessed objectively. To, do, to undertake that exercise, you have regard to the surrounding circumstances known to the parties. It's, that's the objective. It has to be known to both the parties. And you consider the purpose and object of the relevant transaction. And that's what's referred to as the contextual approach, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, you consider all the words of the contract. Obviously, the contract 
is going to be the starting point uh, and the exercise is done with a view to rendering all of those uh, terms and, and clauses harmonious and make them all work together. Uh, and increasingly we're seeing courts resort to phrases like uh, a preference for a business-like construction. Uh, a court will reject a construction that results in what's called commercial nonsense. And, and by and large these days if you have a court of appeal or high court judgment about a contract and what it means, one or other of these sorts of phrases will find its way into the judgment. Um, they, they sometimes say we're here to avoid capricious, unreasonable, inconvenient, unjust outcomes under a commercial agreement, presumably because the judges uh, want to say, look, we're open for business. We understand how business people think and uh, they like to pretend they're in touch with the common, uh, at least business person. Uh, so for those of you tasked on occasion with advising what it is that a, co a contract actually means, uh, the question is how far are you entitled to look outside of the contract to work out what it actually means? So-called issue of, of what use can be made of extrinsic material. Uh, now, in a nutshell, the objective approach set out in Cadelfer, and I'll remind you a bit about Cadelfer in a moment, uh, has been repeatedly reaffirmed by the High Court. That's, that's the issue that, that we only consider things that a reasonable person seized of the information available to all the parties to a contract would consider the contract to mean. Um, and it follows from that that the party's subjective intentions or their actual understanding of what, of what a contract means are entirely irrelevant when it comes to the exercise of construction. That, that being said, those, that may be relevant when it comes to a cause of action that's being pressed in terms of, say, rectification or misrepresentation or misleading and deceptive conduct. Those sorts of subjective understandings may be relevant in that, but if it's just an orthodox exercise of interpreting the contract, it's entirely irrelevant. Uh, and also, of course, then it should follow, not always, but it should follow that um, the evidence of what was said and done in the course of the contract negotiation is inadmissible as an aid to construction. Now, it doesn't stop people every so often trying to put on evidence like that, and sometimes it doesn't stop judges from receiving evidence like that, but by and large, in theory, what was said and done in negotiations, including what's set, in dra set out in drafts of the contract before it was executed, should be irrelevant. Um, I'm going to take you on a little sidetrack now, and I promise I'll get something a bit more interesting soon. This, this issue of the contextual approach has another side to it, namely, there's a suggestion for, arising from Candelfa that um, you don't look outside the contract until and unless there is some aspect of it that is ambiguous. Now, turn your mind back to your contract law days, uh, if you haven't come across Cadell for in 30 years, you'll be, you'll be forgiven. Um, I know that when I was at university, it was still being described as a recent authority, sadly. Um, but in any event, this is what Justice Mason had to say about um, construction of contracts in Cadelfa. He said a lot of other things in, in Cadelfa, but this is, this is the bit that's given rise to the latest controversy. He said, the true rule is that evidence of surrounding circumstances is admissible to assist in the interpretation of the contract if the language is ambiguous or susceptible of more than one meaning. Uh, but it's not admissible to contradict the language of the contract when it has a plain meaning. Generally speaking, facts existing when the contract was made will not be receivable as part of the surrounding circumstances as an aid to construction unless they were known to both parties. And then he says, except for facts that are of notorious. Now, it's the first part of this that's caused a bit of consternation because it suggests that you don't look outside the contract unless you can show that there's something ambiguous about it. Uh, now, that, if that's the true rule, courts tend to have treated that as an inconvenient truth and have had a lot of trouble trying to actually understand what it meant. And, and the result is that every 10 years or so, the High Court comes out and says, no, no, Cadelfa is right but then fails to give really very much guidance about what it means. Uh, and this, we're, we're looking at this year's seen that cycle come around again. 
And it's come about recently because of the following. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Jira decision. It's a very short one. It's actually a decision uh, in which Justices Gummo, Hayden and Bell rejected uh, an application for leave to appeal, a special leave application. Uh, and in that special leave application, the applicant had essentially tried to say, the cases have developed since Cadelpha far enough that you no longer have to identify ambiguity. You're allowed to look outside the contract um, to have a look at the surrounding circumstances. Now, when I say surrounding circumstances, I should say that there's lots of other phrases used to describe the surrounding circumstances of the agreement. Sometimes it's the background, it's the surrounding circumstances. I, I particularly like the objective factual matrix, uh, which is the, my preferred phrase, uh, because I like Keanu Reeves films, but it also sort of captures the the whole essence you, you, of what, what the contextual approach says you do. You look at, look at all the factors informing the, uh, the background of the, of the transaction. In any event, uh, faced with an applicant saying that we don't have to have ambiguity anymore, the court said this, uh, look, if, if we were going to do that, that would clearly require what we require, reconsideration of what we said in Cadelpha uh, as to the true rule. So everyone thought that was a bit bit clear, but then along comes the Woodside decision, which we'll look at in a moment this year, where the court nevertheless seems to imply that you don't need ambiguity, then that the contextual approach to interpreting a contract uh, it entitles the court always to look at the objective factual matrix, whether or not there's ambiguity. Now, there's been perceived to be a mismatch between those two high court decisions. Uh, so here's how the courts of appeal around the place around the, around Australia have dealt with it. Is ambiguity necessary? In our court of appeal, uh, we've had the uh, court say, "No, no, Jira, Jira applies, um, and we're not going to let in evidence of subjective intentions and understandings of a, of a contract." That's all very well, uh, but then they approach, then they apply the <coughs> contextual approach which is, is essentially what Woodside says. And they go even further than that, and our, our Court of Appeal, much, much to my annoyance, seems prepared to look at the history of the drafting of a clause uh, to see how it's changed over time. Now, generally speaking, looking at the negotiations that lead up to a contract, uh, apart from infringing the objective approach to interpretation, mean it's generally problematic because the steps themselves may be ambiguous and require further elaboration. So looking at how a clause has um, changed over time might require several, uh, several exercises of interpretation of the clause. So personally, I think um, the Court of Appeal in, in this state's gone too far, or certainly it's doing things that aren't particularly productive. I much prefer how the New South Wales Court of Appeal has dealt with it. They, they essentially said this, if Jira is to be read as saying you have to have ambiguity before you can look outside of the contract, well, it's notoriously controversial in that respect. Uh, in other words, it's wrong. Um, then they quite cleverly say, well, uh, the word ambiguity is ambiguous anyway. Uh, and then finally they say, well, you can't consider ambiguity without first understanding the context of the, con of the contract. So very cleverly, they put it the other way around. Um, the Western Australian Court of Appeal is a bit more blunt. Uh, in a recent judgment that we'll look at in a moment, they've said, well, th this conflict between these various decisions has caused a mess. Uh, until the High Court makes it really clear for everybody, we're just going to keep using the contextual approach without caring if there is ambiguity or not. Uh, now that, that's paraphrasing, but not by very much. In, in practice, it doesn't really matter because every time it's come up before a court, they tend to get around the problem by saying, well, this is an ambiguous contract anyway, so we're allowed to go the next step. Uh, and, and realistically, it's pretty hard to see any contract progressing to the point that it gets before a court unless there is something ambiguous, ambiguous about it. it, it it's a pretty brave uh, lawyer who's going to advise their client to try to argue that an unambiguous clause nevertheless has some other meaning. So just to, to wrap up this point before we start having a look at the cases, extrinsic material is admissible as far as it goes to the objective commercial purposes uh, and objects of the transaction, 
It's admissible if it's going to reveal the objective background or genesis to the transaction. But what you can't do with extrinsic material is you can't use it to introduce ambiguity into the agreement. If the agreement's plain on its face, you can't point to extrinsic material to say, actually, there's some doubt as to what a particular clause or phrase means. Uh, it, just the same way that uh, a court is not going to sensibly entertain a party who wants to argue that a clause has a, uh, a, 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 a construction that's not reasonably open. Uh, courts won't use extrinsic material as an opportunity to rewrite the contract. If you want to do that, uh, go for rectification or something like that. Uh, and you can't also use extrinsic material to say, if, if there's an outcome on the face of the agreement that makes commercial sense, you can't point to extrinsic material to say, well, hang on, no, 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 it really means something else which is even more commercial. The, if, if that, I think those last three are really the thrust of what Justice Mason was getting at. If, if the contract's clear enough, there's no warrant to look beyond it to introduce doubt into what the contract is. The contract is the essence of the party's meeting of the mind. Now, the first case we're going to look at is, is really just an illustration of how it is that a court will apply the objective and contextual approaches uh, to a commercial contract and, and also picks up on this sort of commercial nonsense point. Uh, this is a Western Australian case, Technomin and Extrata. It's uh, a, New South, a decision of the Western Australian Court of Appeal. And the facts were this. It involved three sets of mining tenements. The ones on the left there uh, were, sub were subject to joint ventures. Uh, the Violet Range tenement was a standalone tenement that was uh, held by Technomin, or rather Technomin's predecessor, a company called Hunter. Um, Technomin's predecessor and Extrata's predecessor entered into a deed of assumption, uh, a deed of assignment and assumption under which Extrata took over Technomin's obligations under the joint venture and took over the uh, Violet Range tenement. And there was also, as part of that transaction, uh, what was called the gross production royalty deed that I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, what was in it for Extrata really was this. They, Extrata held a series of other tenements that abutted the Violet Range tenement, so it was quite an attractive transaction for it uh, in that perspective. What it then did was it amalgamated the tenements, because they're all a contiguous area of land, and took out a mining lease over that area, and unsurprisingly then stuck a mine on one of its uh, existing tenements. Not the Violet Range tenement, I should say, it stuck a mine on the um, one of its other tenements. At this point, this was the trigger for Technomin to start rubbing its hands together for the following reason. Under the gross production royalty, there was a 2% gross uh, royalty payable on uh, production from what was called tenements, capital T. So the question was, what does tenements mean? Well, obviously it means the original tenements that were contained within that uh, square green box there. But there was a second part to the definition drafted by someone who evidently didn't like commas. Uh, because they said, and any extension or variation or replacement or substitution of any of them, and for completeness, whether or not also affecting other tenements or land outside the area. The area was essentially uh, the area in the green box. Now, those of you that know small mining companies can probably anticipate what it was that Technomin decided to argue based on those uh, orange words in the second part of the definition, namely... Uh, the gross production royalty deed means that you have to pay us 2% royalty on the proceeds of the mine that you stuck on your tenement. Now, it might sound surprising, but it did, uh, it did, that was the argument placed, and it's probably pretty easy to predict, based on common sense, uh, what the outcome of that argument was going to be. Um, at first instance, take them in lost. Uh, and on appeal, which is this decision, uh, also lost unanimously. But in the course of doing that, it's interesting to look at what the court considered as part of the legitimate background that it could um, take into account. And it included things like this. There was a previous heads of agreement that, pre that um, came before the deed of assignment and assumption. 
Uh, it was one of those heads of agreement that's designed to be immediately enforceable, um, but superseded or, or fleshed out, if you like, by a second enforceable, more complete agreement, namely the deed. Uh, and it, that was held to be part of the objective background, uh, and the court was able to consider, thought it said it was legitimate to consider whether there was a mismatch between the deed and the heads of agreement that had preceded it. The legislative context was also very important, um, especially the workings of how the Mining Act works and how tenements are regulated and how mining leases are tenements. And finally, there was, there was evidence that it was common practice to amalgamate tenements in the way that Extrata had done. And, and the court said that, well, it was, it was almost inevitable that once uh, Extrata took rights over adjoining tenements, that it would amalgamate them. And all of this was held to be well, part of the objective contractual matrix, if you like, uh, in which you would interpret the, the meaning of that royalty provision. And ultimately, the court concluded that the purpose of the words, uh, this, this extension language, were to make sure that Hunter, that, that is Technomin's entitlement under the clause, under the royalty provision, did not diminish. In other words, just because it, other, other tenements came along and, and connected with it doesn't mean that the right to take royalties from production from that tenement was thereby reduced. Uh, that was, in the words of the court, the most obvious or objectively determined purpose for that clause. Uh, and then they said, or was it, sorry, Justice McClure said, everybody else agreeing, uh, that it was commercially unreasonable to infer that Extrata's actions could increase the royalty area. It was, it was essentially a matter for Extrata whether it wanted to amalgamate them or, or otherwise develop its own tenements. And the court said, well, it just doesn't make sense commercially to say that the parties intended for this situation to give rise to entitlement on Technomin to get an extra 2% on something that it had no connection with. And that makes perfectly reasonable sense. Bring us to the second topic, uh, reasonable endeavours. Uh, you're probably mostly familiar, all of you will be familiar with this sort of phraseology, reasonable endeavours, best endeavours, uh, all reasonable efforts, all due diligence, th those sorts of phrases. Most of us in, in our careers, if we draft contracts, will have resorted to language like that uh, at some point. In a nutshell, this is what the cases really say, and apologies for the, the strange tabbing. Um, you, you don't have to ruin yourself if you're obliged to take reasonable uh, if, you're, if you're obliged to undertake reasonable endeavors, you're not, you're not obliged to ruin yourself. You, you don't have to incur losses necessarily. Uh, you're entitled to preserve your commercial interests. Uh, you do have to do what's reasonable in the circumstances. You may have to try more than once. If, uh, you might have to try doing something a different way. If the first one doesn't succeed, you might have to try doing it again at a different point in time if circumstances change. Uh, but other than that, the answer to most of the questions you'll have about reasonable endeavours and what it means is it depends on the context. Now, the, when, I, when I said most of us have resorted to this language, I, I didn't mean in a pejorative sense that there's lots of good reasons why, in a commercial contact, you might need to use phrases like reasonable endeavours. The, the objective that everybody's trying to achieve is speculative. You might be trying to expand markets, um, develop new products. The steps to get there might be difficult to express, at least comprehensively. Uh, usually where you have a reasonable endeavours clause, it's because one party is relying on the other party's expertise to get something done uh, and it doesn't really make any sense for the parties to try and spell out or, or limit how that party is, in, is to exercise, uh, is to achieve the outcome. Where one party's relying on the other party to get the job done without, you know, however it happens to need to do it. Uh, and of course there's vicissitudes and external forces that might intervene. Uh, there might be a need to get planning permits, there might be other uh, dependencies on third parties that are outside of the control of the um, party obliged to uh, exercise its reasonable endeavours. Now that brings us to the second case, our first High Court decision, that most of you, some of you might have heard of it. Um, it's quite an amusing one. It's another Western Australian one, of course, and it's, it's generally referred to these days as the Woodside decision. It came out 
about the middle of this year. And the facts were these. The appellant, the Electricity Generation Corp, is a statutory body in Western Australia tasked with getting electricity to the good residents of Western Australia or parts of it. Um, now, evidently, someone with a ponytail and a name like Lance decided that Electricity Generation Corp is too boring a name and so perhaps loving synonyms too much came up with the name Verve Energy instead. So it's, it tends to get referred to in the judgment as, as Verve. So that's what I'll do from now on. Now the other players in this particular case are a company called Apache, it's not a party to it, uh, and a block of people called The Sellers. Now the sellers are actually a group of five different um, gas producers. Woodside just happened to be the first named respondent, no doubt much to the joy of the other ones because this is always going to be called the Woodside case, not the Woodside Chevron, BP, Shell and uh, BHP case. But in any event, the, the sellers were a block of um, gas producers and, and between them, the sellers and Apache basically supplied all of the gas to the Western Australian market. The sellers and Verve were parties to a gas supply agreement, the contract in, in dispute in this case. And under that agreement, we're required to provide two things. First, a maximum daily quantity of gas, um, and that was at a fixed price. And, and the way the contract worked was Verve was required to give rolling daily forecasts of its gas requirements. Now, uh, uh, if the requirements on a particular day were less than the maximum daily uh, quantity, the sellers were obliged only to provide that smaller amount, uh, but they weren't out of pocket because there was a take or pay provision in the clause such that over the whole year, Verve was required to take a minimum amount of gas or at least pay for a minimum amount of gas whether or not it took it. So if, even if the stipulated maximum daily quantity wasn't reached, the sellers wouldn't be out of pocket because uh, essentially Verve would be paying for the difference anyway. But if the daily requirement was greater than the maximum daily amount, then um, the sellers were obliged to provide, the sellers were obliged to use reasonable endeavours to supply what was called the supplemental maximum daily quantity. In other words, the excess or, or the, the extra amount that Verve needed for that particular day. It wasn't an, it wasn't an absolute obligation, it was a reasonable endeavours obligation, and we'll look at the clause in a moment. And again, it was for a fixed price. The parties had, had agreed a sort of a 20-year fixed price schedule for the pricing to under the gas supply agreement. Now, what happened was this. On the 3rd, the 3rd of June 2008, there was an explosion uh, at one of Apache's facilities and the result was that the amount of gas available to the market dropped by about 30 to 35 per cent. Now the seller's reaction to this was to do the following the next day. First of all they said to Verve, look, look unfortunately we're not going to be able to supply you with any of the supplemental uh, maximum daily quantity for the near future. But we've got a great idea. How about you enter into us enter into with us a fully interruptible gas supply agreement and that by, by that language read we don't have to do anything we'll, we'll out of the goodness of our heart we might supply you extra gas that just happens to be the same amount as the supplemental um, maximum daily quantity not at the fixed price though we'll, we'll give it to you at the, at the market price which understandably at this point in time was a lot higher than the fixed price under the gas supply agreement now Verve's reaction was to say Oh, that, that doesn't sound like a very good idea, but uh, we're, we're over a barrel here. So under protest, they accepted that. Uh, now, by 20th of June, it became apparent that the interruption to Apache's supply was going to last a bit longer than everybody thought, uh, up until the end of September, in fact. So the sellers said at that point, uh, look, we've got another great idea. Uh, we're not going to give you any more gas under the first fully interruptible gas supply agreement, here's a great idea. How about you tender for the right to get um, supplemental maximum daily quantities? Uh, and out of the goodness of the heart, they accepted Verve's tender, again, under, which was lodged under protest, entered into a second fully interruptible gas supply agreement, 
at, well, I don't think it was quite the market price, probably a bit higher at this point, it was the tendered price. Um, and that was the basis on which the supplemental amounts were provided um, for uh, until the end of September when Apache got its operations up and running again. And I have to say, I, I can't understand why it is that resources companies have a bad name when, when I see this sort of um, adherence to reasonable endeavours clauses. Now, the issue in this case was, did, did the sellers actually discharge their reasonable endeavours obligation under the gas supply agreement to supply that supplemental amount? The sellers were successful at first instance uh, in, in saying that no, reason, the, the clause did not require them to provide the supplemental daily quantity. It was the, their provision of that under other contracts at a, at a higher price, that, that was a legitimate exercise. Uh, on the Court of Appeal, uh, they failed. And it was interestingly the same bench uh, as in the Technomin case, uh, which led to the appeal to the High Court. And the outcome in the High Court might surprise you, but, but in, in summary, the sellers won. But let's have a look at, what, look at why. Th this is the clause that was causing everyone consternation. And, and it's really, I think, why they won. Because the, you might question, if this had just been a vanilla, you will use your reasonable endeavours, I, I think the outcome was probably going to be different. But, but have a look at what, what the clause actually said. 3.3a essentially says, if, if uh, Verve needs more than the maximum, the sellers must use reasonable endeavours to make available for delivery up to an additional amount, na namely the supplemental amount. But then it, then it went on and said, in determining whether they are able to supply, and that word able attracted a bit of attention, the sellers may take into account all relevant commercial, economic and operational matters. That phrase also occasioned some discussion. But without limiting those matters, uh, there were some sub-matters that I've summarised there that could inform that decision. And, and you can see that they really focus on whether or not there was the capacity to supply uh, rather than a willingness to supply, if you like. So if they didn't have enough capacity, if there wasn't enough time to get the supplemental um, gas produced, or if it conflicted with other obligations to other customers. Now, the majority made up of just Chief Justice French uh, and Justices Hayne, Crennan and Kiefel said, said this, the maximum daily quantity, the, the amount that the sellers were obliged absolutely to provide, reflected the chief commercial purpose of the agreement. Uh, and the party's interests were aligned. And they were aligned because uh, the sellers had an absolute obligation to supply the maximum daily quantity and, the, and Verve had an obligation to pay, whether it took it or not, uh, as if the maximum daily quantity had been supplied. And they went on to say, this, this bit about the supplemental maximum daily quantity, that, that was a supplementary commercial purpose and one where the interests of the parties might not align. Uh, they said that the parties in respect of, of the excess had their own independent business interests and, and the, the reasonable endeavours clause was really about balancing those competing interests. Uh, so and that's, that's what they said, clause three really provides for a balancing and sets out by that second half an internal standard of, of what a reasonable endeavour would be. And, and this phrase, commercial, economic and operation matters, captured the concept of all of the seller's legitimate business interests. Um, they noted rightly that the little examples that might inform that decision were, were non-exhaustive uh, and not really confined to capacity issues. And, and when, um, when we see that word able, whether the, if you go back, whether the uh, sellers are able to supply, well, that doesn't necessarily mean just capacity. Uh, it means having regard to your legitimate business interests outside of the contract. Uh, and the conclusion was that, therefore, Clause 3.3 did not compel the sellers to supply the supplemental amount 
notwithstanding their own business interests. They are entitled to prefer their own business interests over those of Verve. Now, I think the decision's right, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's some of you here that thinks that Verve got a raw deal. Uh, just a quick show of hands, who, who thinks Verve should have actually won? Who thinks that wasn't really reasonable endeavours? Yeah, that was, my, that was my reaction as well. Also the reaction of uh, Justice Gagler, who put in a very strong dissent, I think, and he made the following points. Look, the parties agreed a fixed price in this contract, and if the sellers were right, then they basically had a discretion not to supply just because they could get a better price elsewhere. Uh, you know, Verve was stuck, it couldn't go elsewhere. Um, and, and if that was right, well, there's no point really having clause 3.3 at all. And he said, look, an ordinary person would read that clause as being directed to the ability or the capacity to deliver, and it wasn't going to be avoided just because the sellers subjectively were unwilling to provide this gas. Um, he did concede that well, the clause means that so the sellers aren't required to make a loss, if it suddenly became really expensive for some reason to produce the gas, such that the fixed price became completely uneconomical, well, that, that's fair enough. But it, you can't just get out of it because you, you can get a better deal elsewhere. Uh, well, unfortunately, Justice Gagler was in the, is in the dissent, but I think, I think his decision makes a bit more sense. But, but as I said, I, I think if you're faced with a reasonable endeavours clause that's just a vanilla reasonable endeavours clause and doesn't go on to say what considerations can really be brought to bear, uh, the outcome might have been different. That being said, there, there are a number of cases, especially in the UK, that say reasonable endeavours, without needing to say anything more, still entitles you to prefer your own business interests over those of the other party. Especially if it says something like reasonable commercial endeavours or reasonable or commercially prudent endeavours. That sort of language tends to imply you can go a step beyond. The third thing... How are we going for time? Am I, am I running out? Hang on. I don't want you to miss out on your breakfast or break. Ah, I think I'll, I'll canter through this. Uh, the third area I wanted to talk about is, is implied terms. I'll, I'll go through it very quickly. You're probably familiar with the concept. Uh, it applies at various levels. There are terms that you can argue are implied into all contracts. There are terms that you can argue implied into contracts of a particular class, uh, and then there's contracts, uh, terms that are implied only into an individual contract. Uh, and you'll probably be familiar with the, um, the BP and Shire of Hastings decision, the five-step test that you apply to work out whether an individual term should be implied into a contract. I'm just going to focus on the first two uh, because I, I think that if you get to the stage where you need to argue that there is an overriding implied term for all contracts or a particular class of contracts, you, you tend to be in trouble. You're more likely to be successful if you're trying to say this particular contract has this particular implied term. So looking at the first two, what I wanted to focus on is implied terms that imply an overlay of standards of performance on the parties to a contract. It, it's generally accepted in Australia that there is an implied duty to cooperate between parties to all contracts. Uh, it's, it's called the duty to cooperate. It's, it's expressed in terms like the duty to act reasonably so that each, each of you can realise the commercial objectives of the contract, things like that. In New South Wales, you'll probably be familiar that there is a duty to act in good faith or reasonably, even in commercial agreements. That's readily implied, and most of you will have heard of the Burger King decision, but I've left the citation there uh, for you to have a look at. Uh, notably in Victoria, uh, our Court of Appeal has made it clear that a duty of good faith is not going to be implied indiscriminately into commercial agreements. They, our Court of Appeal and Supreme Court takes the view, well, you've got parties to commercial contracts, they're big, big players, uh, or they're at least independently uh, represented, they can look after themselves. If you want to say that there's some overriding standard of performance in your particular agreement, we'll listen to that but you still have to pass the five-point test in the BP refinery case. It has to be necessary, it has to go without saying, it can't contradict the express terms of the agreement. Uh, and the last case I'll canter through just to illustrate how difficult it can be to imply a term that governs the relationship between parties as opposed to how the parties to perform uh, is, this, is this decision 
of the High Court a few months ago. Now the facts were this, that's a timeline down the bottom. Uh, in November 1981, Mr Barker was employed by the Commonwealth Bank uh, and certainly by July 2004 there was a contract in place that governed the relationship. It provided for four weeks notice. Uh, by 2009, Mr Barker had risen through the ranks to the exciting position of Executive Manager, Adelaide Corporate Banking, Institutional and Business Services, South Australia. That would have been an extremely long sign to put on his office door, I'd imagine. Uh, on the 2nd of March 2009, he was told by his boss uh, that his position was uh, no longer, was a surplus to requirements, uh, and that if he didn't find another position within the bank in four weeks, he'd be out the door. The next day, uh, he was put on gardening leave, uh, which also entailed him ceasing to have access to his uh, emails and work voicemail. Jumping forward two and a half weeks of his four weeks to find something else to do, uh, an email is sent to him by someone in HR saying, we'd be really happy if you come along and work with us to talk about your redeployment. They sent that email to his now blocked work email, so he didn't see that uh, for a few days later. Then he got another email from um, someone in career support within the bank. Uh, and the email basically said, where are you? We've been trying to, I've left heaps of voice messages for you. Why haven't you been in contact with us? Uh, and of course the voice messages were left on his work voicemail, which he couldn't access anymore. Um, by this stage, I think his solicitor, had, he'd gotten solicitors and, and letters had been gone back and forth. But in any event, they couldn't sort out their differences um, by the 9th of April. And he was, you know, he got the chop. Now, I missed a step. By the 26th of March, they'd found another position for him. Uh, it was a position described as Executive Manager of Service Excellence, uh, possibly overseeing the Commonwealth Bank's financial advisors or something. Um, but the, 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 thing about, the thing about that was that position, his boss didn't think he was appropriate, he was suitable for that position. In other words, it was a position, but not one that they were going to give him. Now, Mr Barker argued all the way up to the High Court that um, the Commonwealth Bank's behaviour had breached uh, an implied obligation to him. Uh, and the question at each level was this, do employment contracts complain, contain an implied term that neither party will, without reasonable cause, conduct itself in a manner likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of trust and confidence between them? That might seem like quite a complicated language for an implied term, but it picks up on UK decisions where that term has been held to be implied into employment contracts in the UK. At first instance, uh, Justice Basenko said yes, uh, that implied term exists and the Commonwealth Bank's actions in failing to follow its own redundancy policy, which was incorporated into the agreement, was a breach. Court of Appeal said yes, that term is in there, um, but the breach wasn't so much the failure to abide by your own redundancy policy, it was uh, this sort of incompetence in, in trying to actually meaningfully engage with him uh, and not communicate within the people tasked with helping him for an unreasonably long period. And then up in the High Court, it said, the High Court said, no, there is not to be implied into contracts this sort of, this sort of term. Uh, and, and this is why I say it's going to be very hard if you're going to try and rely on an implied term that tries to govern the standards of behaviour as opposed to specific performance of specific obligations. It's going to be hard to get that in there because the court said, no, if these implied terms really go beyond what's necessary for this class of contract uh, because state and federal legislation and, and, and awards and all sorts of other things already provide a balance between uh, the party's rights and obligations and, and, and they already govern the relationship. We're only going to imply a term like good faith or something like good faith if it's strictly speaking necessary to do so. And they, they looked at the UK cases and said, well, the UK is very different in this area. Um, our context is completely different. The development of the law here is completely different. We're not going to follow the UK decision. Uh, now, just a, just a quick one. You'll be aware there are other sources 
of um, obligations <coughs> and, and standards that govern parties' relationships. There's statutory and common law unconscionability. The statutory uh, form of unconscionability specifically refers to good faith as one of those factors you can consider. Um, there's fiduciary relationships. There are specific classes of contract in which there is an obligation to act in good faith that's been uh, imposed as a result of statute. The only thing I'll really note here is for those of you that advise franchise parties to franchise agreements, sometime next year, possibly as early as the start of next year, there's going to be a change to the franchising code of conduct such that uh, there will be an express obligation on both parties to act in good faith um, and it will attract a civil penalty of 300 units if breached. Uh, it also specifically preserves the, the common law uh, um, aspects of good faith uh, and there's a few other bits and pieces in it but uh, if you're interested in that have a look at the competition and consumer exposure draft of the regulations clause 7 sets out a new express obligation of good faith in franchise agreements. Now just, just wrapping it all up from the cases that we've seen this year uh, and aspects of them I haven't gone into, here's, here's really where it's all going. If you're drafting a contract, you need to bear in mind the following. As a result of some of the things that the courts have been saying this year, first of all, the, the recitals and the preamble might matter. I know some people tend to think that the recitals to a contract have no real effect, but the courts are increasingly having a look at those and whether or not you've got that bit in the contract that says they're just for interpret, uh, they're just for information purpose only and don't have any uh, interpretive impact. Nevertheless, the court will look at them as part of the overall objective matrix before you get into understanding what the contract means. The labels you've chosen for fra for particular concepts may matter. Courts tend to assume that you don't arbitrarily choose a label, uh, especially for. Um, complex sort of financial type definitions like internal rate of return, um, current market value, things like that, they will assume that there is meaning to a label you've chosen. The worked examples that you put in an agreement, usually I'm, I'm quite a big fan of worked examples uh, where there's some sort of calculation to take place in an agreement, they may matter even if you say they're only for information purposes only. Uh, it's still the case that if you're contract incorporates terms and other documents by reference. Um, if you don't read those and you're going to be bound by something in them, that's your tough luck. It's been the case for a while, but that's been reaffirmed. The, the big one is if you're going to have a reasonable endeavours clause in there, you should seriously think closely about whether you need to elaborate on what sorts of factors can inform the exercise of a reasonable endeavours uh, obligation. Do you need to qualify it in some way? Do you need to anticipate some sorts of circumstances that need specific mention? Uh, and then finally, don't expect implied terms to help. If, if, if you're drafting a contract and something's important, get it in there. Uh, I've set out in the last slide here just, just the authorities if you want to go and have a read of some Court of Appeal decisions and, and the Woodside decision. Uh, and the final slide, of course, if you've got any questions or want to discuss further, my contact details. And with that, I'll let you guys go and have another drink and, uh, and we'll be back soon with Kylie's presentation.